The second trailer for the highly anticipated Dune Part 2 is a cinematic spectacle. Visually arresting, narratively dense, and artistically polished, it serves as a tantalizing glimpse into what we can expect from the full film. In this video, I'd like to offer a detailed scene-by-scene -scene dissection of the trailer, exploring my own thoughts as a fan of this universe, identifying intriguing plot points, and addressing my potential concerns. Spoiler warning if you are unfamiliar with Frank Herbert's Dune. The trailer begins with a line from our protagonist, Paul Atreides. This world is beyond cruelty. These words set the tone for what unfolds next. A Harkonnen vessel, possibly a spice harvester, firing at individuals on the ground. These are likely Fremen known to resist the Harkonnen spice harvesting operations, as shown in Dune Part 1. The trailer is continuing the narrative thread of the Harkonnen's brutal subjugation of the Fremen, a key driving force behind the Fremen's zealous efforts to reclaim their home planet. Paul continues, You've been fighting the Harkonnens for decades. My family's been fighting them for centuries. This statement is reflective of the chronology from the original novels, where the Harkonnens have reigned over Arrakis for about 80 years. The feud between the Atreides and Harkonnens, however, stretches back several millennia. The trailer successfully conveys this ancient animosity, presenting the Harkonnens as oppressive overseers on Arrakis. The Baron, in the absence of the deceased Pyder de Vries, has entrusted Arrakis to Beast Raban, instructing him to exploit the planet and its inhabitants to recuperate the losses incurred during the attack on the Atreides. Images of Harkonnens burning Atreides' corpses punctuate Paul's narration about the massacre of his house that took the life of his father. Jessica, Paul's mother, then asserts, Your father didn't believe in revenge. This statement teases a major conflict in the upcoming film, Paul's struggle to reconcile the Atreides' inherent desire for justice with the risk of succumbing to vengeful impulses. Interestingly, in the novel, Paul's prophetic visions reveal a future where he could avoid war by reconciling with the Baron Harkonnen, an option he finds too repugnant to entertain. As a result, his quest for justice propels him down a war-torn path, the trailer gives us a glimpse of Jessica's battle prowess as she strikes down a Harkonnen soldier. As a Bene Gesserit, she represents one of the strongest warriors in House Atreides, so it's entirely accurate to continue to depict her strength in this way. We also hear Chani, Paul's love interest, saying, We believe in Fremen. Her sentiment begins a thread of her apparent rejection of the Fremen prophecies, which for me was somewhat of a surprising development. In the book, there are a few Fremen who express skepticism about Paul's messianic status, but the decision to have Chani voice these doubts is an interesting choice. The trailer goes on to regularly showcase Chani's action-filled scenes, with her shooting down an ornithopter and later engaging in intense hand-to-hand -hand combat. Next, the trailer delves into a tense sequence where we see Paul, Stilgar, Chani, and their company poised to enter a Fremen siege. A Fremen blocks their way, declaring Paul's unwelcome presence. This scene echoes a critical dynamic from Herbert's novel, where much of Paul's journey in the latter half revolves around uniting the scattered tribes of Fremen, working to earn their trust and kindling their rebellion against the Harkonnens. Following this scene, Chani says, I won't be fighting for him, I'm fighting for my people. This initially caught me off guard due to the fact that when Paul embraces his Fremen name, he effectively intertwines his fate with theirs, becoming part of the tribe. The explicit distinction Chani draws here underscores her continued skepticism towards the flourishing messianic aura surrounding Paul, as well as an unease regarding his authentic assimilation into the Fremen community. As I've stated previously, this tension aligns with some of the Fremen's reluctance in the novel, yet it is surprising to witness this coming from Chani. Furthermore, Chani's apprehensive lines appear to be a step back from the growing intimacy between her and Paul as shown in the first trailer. My optimistic assumption is that perhaps this conflict arises early in their relationship, gradually resolving as Chani becomes a fundamental pillar of support for Paul, helping him navigate the turbulent sea of his emerging powers and unsettling visions. The trailer then shows us the heartfelt reunion between Paul and his mentor Gurney Halleck, likely occurring right after the Fremen's assault on the spice smugglers who are led by Gurney. 
I loved seeing this touching moment recreated so faithfully. The emotions conveyed by the actors here made this part of the trailer one of my favorite moments. Soon after this, we witness a dialogue between Jessica and Stilgar, where she asks, Do you believe in Paul? And he responds, There are signs, which then cuts to Paul's sandworm ride. His inaugural ride is a pivotal event that not only cements Paul's status as a leader among the Fremen, but also as their prophesied messiah, and we continue to see Stilgar's growing faith in Paul manifest throughout the trailer. In a subsequent conversation, Gurney encourages Paul to embrace the messianic rumors surrounding him. Paul counters, lamenting the horror he sees in his visions, highlighting his fear not of losing control, but of the dread that awaits when he assumes it. During this exchange, we see glimpses of various visions and a couple of shots of the Water of Life ceremony, giving us our first look at the ancient Fremen Reverend Mother Romalo. The ceremony has the potential to be a surreal visual spectacle, however, given Villeneuve's minimalistic and practical directorial style, this is another aspect I am excited to see translated onto the screen. A moment of silence follows when Paul asks Chani if she believes in him. This silence further emphasizes Chani's struggle to fully accept Paul, an internal conflict which again is not prominently highlighted in the novel. The trailer then transitions to give us our first look at Christopher Walken's Emperor Shaddam Carino IV. We see his daughter Irulan in various outfits indicating her varied scenes, expressing concern over Paul Atreides' survival. In one scene, as she sits with her father in a verdant setting, she subtly shifts a board game piece, which in a way is no doubt intended to mirror the galactic chess game of power. The Emperor's command to deal with this prophet is likely addressed to the members of House Harkonnen, as the frame cuts to monochrome images of Fade Rotha with his signature twin blades. Watkins Shaddam is seen speaking dismissively about Duke Leto to Paul, which might hint at a refusal to acknowledge the genuine threat Paul poses to his reign within the Imperium. I find Watkins' casting as Emperor compelling, even though he appears older than he is described in the book due to the Spice's life-prolonging effects. However, despite this, Walken's iconic acting prowess has me eagerly anticipating his performance. We also catch a glimpse of the Baron, presumably speaking to Fade, saying, Show me who you are, possibly right before Fade's arena fight with Lieutenant Landville of House Atreides, portrayed by Roger Yuan. Dave Bautista's Beast Raban then says, Look who's back from the dead, as he appears to see Gurney Halleck ascending a staircase. This tantalizing interaction hints at a potential showdown between Gurney and the Beast, who are bitter rivals in the book. While their battle is not a part of the events of the novel, I feel that an original scene showcasing the culmination of their bitter feud would be quite satisfying for fans of the book. The trailer then presents a touching scene between Paul and Shani, where Paul tearfully accepts his destined path, despite the large-scale destruction it entails. The scene is heightened emotionally by a tear on Chani's face, a significant gesture viewed with profound reverence among the water-conserving Fremen. Subsequently, Paul walks through a crowd of Fremen as Jessica, now their reverend mother, states, We gave them something to hope for. Paul retorts, That's not hope. Again highlighting his inner struggle to accept his prophetic persona, even though he and his mother are acutely aware of the manufactured elements of the Fremen's religion. The trailer transitions to a moment of profound intensity as we see Chani fighting fiercely on an active battlefield, while Paul is seen shouting her name, fraught with desperate concern. This scene closely mirrors a prescient vision Paul experienced in the first installment of Villeneuve's Dune, which leads me to conclude that this could be yet another of his unsettling visions. His fear of losing Chani remains tangible and manifests in a promise he makes to her, I will love you as long as I breathe, followed by a passionate embrace. I feel that these scenes with Chani accentuate Villeneuve's determination to foreground her as a pivotal character in Dune Part 2. This is consistent with the original material where she is not just a formidable Fremen warrior, but also a constant companion at Paul's side on his rise to lead their people. Next, we hear Chani saying, This prophecy is how they enslave us. 
Overall, I feel that this sentiment accurately encapsulates the larger narrative trajectory of the Dune Saga, because it is true that the Bene Gesserit have skillfully manipulated Fremen prophecies to gain control and secure their allegiance to their prophesied superbeing, the Kwisatz Haderach. However, Chani's overt rejection of the Fremen's deeply held religious tenets leaves me feeling somewhat uneasy. Chani is a Sayadina, a lower priestess in the Fremen spiritual hierarchy. She assists in the Water of Life ceremony and stands in line to become the next Reverend Mother and spiritual leader. Because of this, her outward defiance of their long-revered prophecies seems to be a bit out of character. While her skepticism towards Paul's messianic persona is entirely understandable, her vehemence against the prophecies themselves feels a tad disconcerting. That being said, I'll withhold judgment on this until I've seen the entire film as the devil is in the details and the execution, so we'll have to wait and see how this turns out. Following a rapid montage of his duel with Phaedratha, we hear Paul asserting, it's not a prophecy, it's a story. This declaration is immediately followed by Stilgar's firm proclamation, I don't care what you believe, I believe. These exchanges provide a fascinating perspective on the progression of the story in Herbert's initial Dune books. As Paul dons the Messiah's mantle, his status spirals beyond his control, failing to convince the Fremen of the truth behind his charade. The Fremen's unwavering belief in their prophecy, surpassing the words of the Prophet himself, ultimately triggers Moadib's Jihad. This catastrophic event sees the Fremen ravage the universe, causing mass destruction and annihilating billions, a cataclysm Paul is powerless to prevent. Stilgar's unshakable faith can thus be seen as the precursor of this rampant jihad, the initial spark igniting a wildfire of devastation. Throughout the trailer, we are presented with numerous explosive sequences, most likely from the Fremen's attacks on Gurney smugglers, as well as their escalating war against House Harkonnen and their battles with the Emperor Sardaukar. We hear Paul assertively stating, I am Paul Moadib Atreides, Duke of Arrakis. His choice to retain his familial name while also embracing his Fremen identity was the result of attempting to test out whether a departure from what he had envisioned could change the course of the future and avoid the full ramifications of the Jihad. The trailer peaks with an unforgettable scene where Paul echoes the Fadaikin's battle cry in the Fremen language, Long live the fighters! This single instance served as reassurance that we'll get to witness Chalamet's Paul wholly embrace his leadership role and demonstrate the profound authority that Moadib commands. Finally, we see Paul looking intensely into the distance as he proclaims, he who can destroy a thing has the real control of it, swiftly followed by an apparent demolition of the shield wall safeguarding the city of Arakeen from the threats of sandstorms and sandworms. This is the key to the Fremen's victory over the Emperor's forces at the end of the book. Reflecting on the entirety of what we've seen from both of the Dune Part 2 trailers, I feel it's important to say that I'm not entirely opposed to many of the creative liberties taken to transpose this complex narrative from a dense, sprawling novel to a visually engaging two-part film. As long as the adaptation remains faithful to the overarching themes of Herbert's source material and retains the fundamental characteristics and crucial arcs of the main characters, I find that many of these alterations are acceptable. Conveying this multifaceted tale in the restrictive time frame of a film requires certain narrative elements to be adapted and adjusted to suit the specific medium. Overall, the second trailer surpassed all of my expectations. Despite my lingering curiosity regarding specific aspects such as the Fremen's faith in their prophecies and Chani's evolving role, my anticipation to watch this film has only intensified. From what the trailer has revealed, Doom Part 2 indeed seems poised to meet, if not surpass, my already high expectations. But I'm curious to know what you thought of the Doom Part 2 trailer. Are there any moments that stand out as your favorite? Is there anything that you've seen so far that makes you concerned about this film? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you did and be sure to subscribe for more Dune and other sci-fi and fantasy news and lore. Thank you all so much for your support. And as always, have a very nerdy day.